Thank you all for coming out. I know it's quite a stretch if you've been at work all day or whatever you've been doing, quite a stretch to come out in the evening and listen to somebody else speak. I hope I won't be too boring for all of you, uh, but we'll uh, keep you on your toes uh, thinking and reflecting. Um, and of course, I don't know most of you in the audience, and of course, that is always a bit of a challenge because the speaker should try and relate to the people he's speaking to, right? But if you don't know their background, their context, or anything, you're sort of coming in blind into this. And so, if you think I step out of line anywhere, just don't hesitate when you ask questions, say, I think you're wrong about that, or you misunderstood this, or whatever. Please, please let's have a dialogue, that would be wonderful. But I'll tell you my perspective on things um, as best I can. So I'm not a stranger to South Africa, as you heard from Mervyn, we first met actually, um, back in, I think, uh, 1988 in Cambridge originally, but then I was out here in 1990 talking to Max Sizulu, who at that time was Head of Economic Policy for the ANC, part of building the relationship with the ANC and the National Party to bring the two sides together for high-level talks in London. They had to be held outside the UK, outside South Africa, I mean, because the ANC couldn't come in, but we were trying to get a transition process started, which then led to the Cadessa talks and all of that, which you know about, and of course you may feel it's all a disaster and should never have happened, but anyway, we believe it was really important for a peaceful transition. And then we were involved in 93-94 to try and uh, bring um, um, Buttelezi and his party into the elections, because as you remember, there was a lot of violence at that time, and uh, our director of our work came and, and brokered a deal between Butelezi and Mandela, right at the last minute, you may remember, in April 1994. But that again is uh, unseen history. Uh, there is a, or was a paper around here, which... Um, um, chairs, I think. Uh, there are some copies around, yeah. So, uh, it's called um, A Co Christian Contribution to Peace Building in South Africa, or something like that. And the story is largely written up there. If you go to Cambridge Papers, cambridgepapers.org, uh, you can probably find it on that website or somewhere. Or ask Mervyn or somebody in the college. Um, so, actually this book, uh, I feel quite embarrassed about the fact that it's only got my name on it, uh, because actually three of us wrote this book. It's called, Is Corporate Capitalism the Best We've Got to Offer? That's the book. There are a few copies over there for sale. But three of us wrote this book, not one. So why is there only one on the cover? This is not an attempt at sort of self-promotion. <laughs> there are three of us, and all three of us should be on the front of this book. Anyway, David Lee, who's written about eight or nine books with me, he died tragically of cancer in November last year, just after we finished writing this script. So his, um, it seemed inappropriate to put his name on the cover, and we've dedicated the book to him but that's why he isn't on the cover. And then a very, very senior corporate lawyer from the city of London, worked in Slaughter and May for years as a corporate lawyer, uh, taught me about companies from about 2007 to 2022. Now, and um, just now. And so he should be on the cover of this book too, but for personal reasons, he didn't feel he could do that. It's a little complicated if you've been in that area of law all these years. Uh, and I won't go into the details of that, but he just felt he couldn't put his name on it. So either I was going to publish it, or we were going to bin it. And my wife said, look, you can't bin it after all these years. You have a responsibility now to publish it, even though it does involve some personal risks in publishing it, which I won't go into. So, um, so here it is. And um, yeah, if you're interested, there is a summary that you can get by going onto the relationalresearch.org website. And also there's a very significant other piece of work we've done, which is to redefine the human rights agenda. It's called Relational Rights, which I think is key to understanding culture in Western countries today, and to trying to hold the world together around a shared narrative around how we think about identity and rights. Anyway, that piece of work is also downloadable free off the same website, relationalresearch.org. So that's the end of my uh, publicity on that. Um, so when I was, uh, in, the, in the period that I was working on this corporate capitalism question, I was down here in South Africa quite a lot. That was partly because 
I had a son and grandchildren here, that was quite a big motivation. But I was having really helpful conversations with a guy called Mervyn King, who designed the King 1, King 2, King 3, King 4 now, corporate governance codes, working with the Institute of Directors because Mandela had asked him to try and help. He said, we're getting a transfer of political power, we need a transfer of economic wealth as well to the black community and we need to do more to achieve that. Can you help us make that happen? So he got involved in corporate governance arrangements, so he's been an important influence on my thinking, um, on I should say our thinking, because we did this together. Jonathan Rushworth was, my colleague was down here with me um, on some of those trips, and, and also um, Ansi Romalo, both of them have commended this book. And I worked with quite a lot of big South African corporates, including Old Mutual here in, in um, Cape Town. In fact, we measured stakeholder relationships in five major corporates with all their major stakeholders. They decided which were their biggest stakeholders. We measured the quality of those relationships and then engaged in a dialogue with the companies about what we discovered by that measurement process. Because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And we're talking relationships. How do you measure relationships? Well. We spent quite a lot of years <laughs> working out how you measure relationships. And it's a really important aspect of our work. And uh, that's a book published by Cambridge University Press called The Relational Lens, uh, Understanding, Managing, and Measuring um, Stakeholder Relationships. So if anybody wants to kind of examine that issue, it's, it's there in quite a substantial book, but it's quite readable, I hope. I want to emphasize at the beginning that I'm going to give a bit of a critique of, of companies this evening, but it is important to remember um, how important companies have been in terms of our quality of life today. You know, modern pharmaceutical products that help us to heal our bodies when we're sick and, and take the, the raw science and put it into, into products that you can buy off the shelf um, at a pharmacy. Or, or have prescribed for you, those things are there because of the work of companies. And a company, which simply means sharing bread together, I mean, that is the, the meaning of the word company. I mean, it has quite a deep sort of Christian resonance to it, doesn't it? Cum panis, <laughs> I mean, uh, share bread. Um, but a company originally is simply a group of people who come together with a shared purpose. We want to do something together. And who can say that's a bad idea, it's a great idea. Limited liability made it a little more complex um, because it kind of started to separate the company as a separate person, a corporate person, from the people who own it and control it or work in it. So that complicates it and has led to a lot of um, thinking uh, from, from a group of us in Cambridge um, as a research project. But if you think about the way it's driven economic progress, but it's also been a, a major driver of social change. And I'll give you two examples today. Just think of the advertising you see that comes from companies on your televisions or social media or wherever. Actually, pretty much all that advertising is about me. I deserve it, or you deserve it, or um, you need this, but it's all about me. They're driving a sort of individualistic understanding of the person and of how you think about yourself, which actually has a long-term impact. And the other thing that disturbs me is that for a long time there's been an assumption that you will have mobility of labor. So if a company needs you to serve them, they won't think about the total social cost of moving you to go from Cape Town, where you live, to work in Johannesburg or in Durban or somewhere else. They won't think of those relationship consequences, nor will they pay for the care of the old people who are left behind when you're now living a thousand miles away. Now, it's the externalizing of the costs to society, okay, the society then will pick that up through the tax system or whatever, but it's the externalizing of those costs, whether it's environmental costs or social costs or whatever, which is a worrying aspect of the way the system works and really difficult to find a solution to how one should avoid that. But it is a, these are social consequences of the way the system works. 
So um, I kind of got mixed feelings. In the book, you'll find a huge number of examples of companies doing great things. They've picked up a lot of the ideas in this book already. Before I wrote them, I mean, they were there. We've just reflected on, and then found them. These companies are doing this stuff in bits. I'm arguing for a more fundamental shift in the purpose of companies. I was talking to some, some people here in Cape Town over lunch. Um, somebody who's a professor at UCT, someone else who's a, um, a consultant to companies on their corporate purpose. And he says, actually, companies are really thinking about their purpose at the moment. And I said, that's great, but what matters is why, where they land on that. If they think their purpose is simply to protect the environment, actually, um, guys, that's not good enough. There has to be something else, which I'm going to explain to you in a minute. So I'm going to flick through these, I hope, fairly quickly and outline the argument as best I can and uh, hope that the way we've thought about this will persuade you to reflect further on the subject. So, and I should just mention one other point <laughs> that's important maybe, that um, I'm not from a corporate background, but the family business, which was started in 1858, was in international coffee trading. And my son buys now, for one of the biggest corporate groups in the world, he buys coffee from Eastern Africa and sells it into Western Europe. And he's in charge of that entire business, um, high-end coffees um, going from Africa to Europe. Uh, now, um, so coffee business has been in my blood since <laughs> I was brought up as a child, and I remember it well. And, uh, and he ran a company with an incredibly impressive social purpose, our own family business until 2016 when changes in the banking rules meant we couldn't get a bank account and he had to stop because international coffee trading is a highly risky business. Uh, you can really lose your shirt on it very easily as well as make money on it. But um, So I have that background in a business. I have a business background. I'm not hostile to business. I want to really make that clear. I just want to make business somehow shift its purpose in a direction which means that it will have a much greater beneficial impact and which society will recognize as something, yeah, we want that. Whereas at the moment, I fear the baby is going to be thrown out with the bathwater because people see its destructive elements, which I'm coming to talk about now, and say, actually, just let's get rid of the whole thing. I don't know what we're going to replace it with, but let's get rid of it. But that's not a solution. There's a much better solution. I think as a Christian, that social, the sort of social change we want to see is through persuasion, not through violence. Think of the abolition of slavery. Uh, William Wilberforce and that gang, who I greatly admire, you know, they made their changes through persuasion. It took a long time, but it really shifted the mindset in order to end the slave trade. It was worth the battle, but you have to persuade. So, here are some of the things that I think are wrong with corporate capitalism. I put four of them there. Pay differentials. So look at the average numbers. They're all quoted in the book. And the differential between the median in the company and the top level just goes on increasing. It's now 250 times or something like that. The median, the middle range of pay and the top level of pay. But between the top and the bottom, take somebody on the pick and pay checkout desk in Joburg, who I talk to sometimes on my way out to pick and pay. And then you look at that chief executive or something. I haven't actually looked at the numbers since I was working here in the mid, um, in about 10 years ago, uh, looking at these numbers in detail. But I can tell you roughly what the pay differential is going to be, and that is roughly a thousand to one. So that means that all of us are accepting the idea that a, a girl on a checkout We'll have to work for a thousand years, a thousand years, to get the annual income of the chief executive. Now, is there anybody in the room that can put up their hand and say, yeah, I think that's completely fair? I don't see many hands, maybe you just don't dare. <laughs> but it is, I think, really worrying. And if you look at what's going on in the city of London, in a big bank, let's say, and the person who's on the checkout, is probably 5,000 years to earn the salary of the chief executive. I mean, these pay differentials have just widened like this. Uh, JP Morgan, 
who was the founder of the, of the J.P. Morgan Bank, he said in 1920, I can never conceive a situation where a differential of more than 1 to 20 could be justified between the top and bottom level of pay in a company. 1 in 20? Well, I'm going to suggest what we do about that in a minute, but... And then you've got so much employee disengagement. Um, in Britain, we talk about this as quiet quitting. Quiet quitting. I turn up to work, I want to keep my job, I want to keep my salary, but I'm just going to do the minimum I can to make sure I don't get fired. Quiet quitting. So employees don't feel they buy in to the purpose of the company. They don't believe in it. And that means they don't contribute to innovate, which really undermines the productivity of the company. Because actually, if you look globally, uh, I speak about this as an economist, a major driver of innovation actually comes from employees who see little ways to improve things because they do it every day. And if only someone would listen to them and reward them for contributing those ideas, they can tell the management how to make things better. But quite quitting. Thirdly, shareholder non-engagement. So there is a problem now that you can trade shares in the financial markets, and this is what's happening particularly in the US, in, it's down now to about a millionth of a second. A friend of mine in Cambridge was spending several years helping companies increase the speed of trading from a hundred thousandth of a second to a millionth of a second in the markets. It moves and within a millionth of a second you've moved your shares. So if you think shareholders should take some responsibility for what a company decides to do, how can you take that responsibility if you only own the shares for a millionth of a second? I mean, just, it just, it's just not going to happen, right? So there's a problem there. And then fourthly, environmental damage. Now, a friend of mine in Joburg uh, is doing a fantastic job with one of the mining companies in trying to tackle its environmental damage. And I think that's a fantastic way to spend one's life. And I think the underlying motivation is to say, well, as ESG criteria in companies, environmental, social, governance uh, change uh, is insisted on more and more in Western countries, then South African companies, mining companies, if they are really compliant with the environmental agenda, are going to be top of the list for people to invest in. So there's a kind of self-interest as well going on here, which is quite fine with me, if they make a big difference. But um, the question is, um, we're not doing enough, clearly, in the corporate world because, and I'm talking globally here, not just in the West or South Africa or, or China or anywhere, we're just not doing enough because um, two-thirds of the weight of a whale now is microplastics. Two-thirds of the weight of a whale. <laughs> Imagine, actually, a whale is now mainly made up of plastics. And that just seems insane. Um, and plastics, uh, and plastic rubbish and everything are everywhere. So why are corporates still continuing to use so much plastic? Well, you could say consumers want it. Okay, why are consumers wanting everything wrapped in plastic? Or how do you control that? Now that's not a very, that's quite a, it's not a simple question because as someone explained to me at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership a week or two back when I was visiting them, he said the real problem is this. If we insist on a certain standard on packaging in South Africa, then how do our products compete with other countries that don't have those standards? So they import stuff against our companies who are having to use other forms of more expensive packaging, and they undercut us in the market, and consumers don't have much money, so they're going to buy their products and not our products. So you need the world to agree on what the regulation should say. And when you can get the world to agree on what regulation should be governing these issues? Well, in 50 years time, <laughs> well, that's a bit late by then. So you can see the problems are not entirely straightforward, but somehow we have to tackle environmental damage. Whether you think the key thing is, is, um, is chemical waste or plastics or um, carbon emissions or whatever you think it is, we have to find a way to tackle those issues. And as an underlying general bigger problem, um, Oxfam re released a report a couple of weeks ago in which they said that um, 
about three quarters of the global increase in wealth last year went into the hands of billionaires. Three quarters of the global increase in wealth went into the hands of billionaires, people who already own billions of dollars. That's really disturbing. Is that a problem just of those individuals, or is there a systemic problem here? Which is what I'm going on to think about in my next slide. Can we simply blame individuals? Now, there are situations in which individuals appear to play a big role. Uh, and this is being recorded, so I have to be a little careful here, but it is widely understood that VW falsified emissions data. And as a result, they tried to persuade people that their cars were more environmentally friendly than they actually were, and Toyota did the same thing, and chief executives had to resign, heads had to roll, but the point was, was that just individuals? Or was there somehow a systemic failure? Or take the deep water horizon oil rig, what actually went wrong there? Of course, there was a huge congressional report on that. There was another congressional report on what happened with those Malaysian and um, those Boeing airline disasters that happened in uh, Ethiopia and Malaysia um, some years back now, five years ago, maybe seven years ago, I don't quite remember. But um, these big corporate issues, was it just some individual that went wrong or was there something systemic going wrong? I think Congress, the Congressional report on the Boeing disasters concluded that there were substantial failures uh, and so did the uh, BP, the report on the, uh, on the BP uh, Deepwater Horizon rig um, decided that the problems were um, in the relationships among the different stakeholders, FAA, the, um, the Federal Airline Authority and their relationship with Boeing, there were some systemic problems in the way that that was being managed. And there were problems in the deep water um, disaster. Actually, I happen to know a lot about that because one of the members in my home group in my church in Cambridge was actually working on the, um, the technology that the um, oil rig company was using in their, um, at the bottom of the oil rig to do the mining at the bottom of the oil rig to find the um, oil. And he was telling me about the difficult relationship there was between the company doing that and with the BP that was on the surface. And, and their representatives on the surface of the rig, there was a very difficult relationship there and the relationships were going sour and actually that all then resulted in this terrible catastrophe. So there are questions of the design and the system and in the relationships <clears throat> that occur between individuals but also between networks of people because most of the stakeholders that we talk about in companies, suppliers, customers, shareholders, employees, are actually <coughs> networks of people. You can't just have one person in a room representing all the suppliers. Actually, you need to relate to the suppliers as a network. How do you build relationships with these networks? So the, the book discusses <coughs> human connectivity as an idea, which is kind of in, par in parallel with electronic connectivity. We all know electronic connectivity, we send emails all the time, but you don't get to know people very well just by sending emails. You can so easily misinterpret. <laughs> there was a story told of some guy who got on a plane in Singapore to fly to Chicago, and he got an email from his boss just as he got on the plane. And as soon as he got to Chicago, he called her and said, look, I really didn't mean it. I am sorry, I'm sorry, you know, and I'm sorry that you've had to fire me. And she said, what on earth are you talking about? She said, oh, you wrote me this email. Oh, no, she said, I didn't mean that in the email. What I meant was something completely different. It was this. But of course, she couldn't see the smile on her face. She couldn't, with the email, you don't know quite what was meant. And it's so easy to get completely misunderstood. Now it's much easier if you have a phone call because then you get the tone of voice as well as the words, right? And even better is if you're face to face because then you get the body language and the facial expressions. You can recognize 10,000 
facial expressions in another person. So it's so much better to be in the room. So how do you create human connectivity? Firstly, by know, getting people to know each other and knowing builds trust, and it's much easier to do that if you can arrange meetings. Start with your Zoom meetings, that's better than nothing, but still they've got to be physical meetings, even post-COVID, or maybe especially because of COVID. We need to have physical meetings, and don't think that there's any substitute for that, because just there isn't. And secondly, um, we need to achieve alignment of goals. I mean, that's a big part of our peace building work, <laughs> for example, between the ANC and the white establishment, nationalization of banks and land and all of that. Where are the shared goals here? Where are the shared goals? And you also need perceived fairness, not just fairness as I perceive it, but shared perceptions of what's fair. So, I'll tell you one more little story. Toy Toyota came to the UK and they started a factory up in the northeast to produce to Toyota cars. So they said to all the suppliers of, of those sorts of parts, wheels and uh, emission systems and all of that, we want to come and talk to you. So all the companies thought that they were going to discuss price. So they all got out their pencils and sharpened their pencils and tried to get the lowest price they could possibly offer Toyota. So the, Toyotas, the to 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 Toyota guys come for lunch. They never mentioned price at all in the conversation. All they wanted to know by sitting down with people over lunch was, can we work with these people? Because a Japanese car company like to Toyota depends on building such a strong relationship with its supplier that they will share all their technology with the supplier and expect the supplier to share their technology with them. And that sharing of the technology and information results in driving down the price of the parts so that Toyota wants the part supplier to make more money as well as for Toyota to make more money. So it's a shared venture, a shared profitability. You could say it's a bit like Ubuntu kind of style of <laughs> treating your suppliers. So um, building relationships with your suppliers or your customers turns out to be really important. So I need to move on. So let me think about um, why should companies regard quality of stakeholder relationships as a source of risk? And what we are saying in the book is that we are moving into very turbulent times in the world. Now, maybe you think that COVID was the last pandemic you're going to see in your life. Well, I hope you're right. But I'm not sure you're right. I don't think we can just assume we've seen pandemics off for our generation. Actually, they are generated rather easily, pandemics, and it's not difficult for someone to engineer a pandemic, even today, if they want to. But whether it's a pandemic or whether it's the geopolitical risk between China and the US over Taiwan, for example, or whether it's environmental instability causing floods and everything else, whatever it is, we're moving into a period of volatility. And that creates supply chain risks. And if you want to be sure you're going to get supplies of the parts you want, you need to build close relationships with your suppliers. You need to get to know them so they want to do business with you. And they're not just saying, well, on a short term basis, actually, these guys are offering us more money than you, so we'll go with them. No, you want them to feel so much part of your corporate purpose that you stay with them. Or what about unmotivated employees? Because if your employees are not motivated, they undermine your profitability and your ability to compete in international markets. Or what about the risks to your reputation on social media? So you're treating your consumers like dirt, you don't really worry about them, and some story comes up, it hits social media, goes viral, and suddenly you've lost 50% of your share value on the stock exchange because people think you are a disgusting company, we're not buying from you anymore. And that lasts for at least three months now or it may last for three years. And then, I think we're moving with so much debt in the world now, my friends who 
deal a lot with this. I have one close colleague called Paul Mills. So he was in charge of um, global instability in the Treasury in the UK. He then went to the IMF. He was in charge of the IMF's relationship um, with, um, with Europe. He was their senior economist in Europe, responsible for the relationship between the IMF and the European Central Bank. And he says, with so much debt in the world, there is going to be a major reset. It may come in three years, five years, ten years. But there's going to be a huge global reset. There's going to be immense turbulence in the financial markets. Do you want your shareholders to stay with you? But if they're just trading your, your shares every few seconds, what commitment have they got to you? What reason to be loyal to you? No, we'll just shift our money to wherever we can get the best return. If you want them to stay with you, you've got to sell them your corporate purpose. They've got to believe in you. You've got to have a relationship with them. How do companies build relationships with shareholders and why really should they do it? Well, I'm giving you a practical reason. I'm going to give you a reason from my Christian faith a little later at the end, just to give you a bit more of an explicitly Christian take for those in the room who are interested in that question. So, um, why should companies treat quality of relationships as a source of risk? Well, I think there are four good reasons there that they should pay attention to it. And we suggest in the book uh, a 10 point strategy for building long term relationships with stakeholders that I've come to. But I wanted next to go to this slide. So, um, in this diagram, um, what it tries to show is that companies, I think, as you look at it on the left, no, that's right, yes, companies on the left are maximizing shareholder value. So the focus of the directors is how do we keep the shareholders happy? How do we do that? So the thickness of the lines represents the amount of time and focus that the directors give to the different stakeholders. So the main focus is on the investors, on the fund managers. That's where the directors are, 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 are constantly worrying. They have to give a three month return. They have to make sure it's good enough to keep people investing in the company. And that's the trouble. You don't get long term investment if you're trying to report to companies on every three months basis. It just it isn't helpful to building, you know, in, or investing into new products and processes which may not help your short-term profits. And on the right is what we're proposing, which is a, um, a company that maximizes stakeholder value, and we've listed what the stakeholders we suggest might be. So this shareholder model is, has been particularly prominent since about 1972 because of a famous Chicago economist called Milton Friedman who argued that companies had a duty to maximize returns to shareholders. And then air, the market would then sort out everything else. Everything would then be fine for everybody because the market would sort it out. You'd have trickle down to everybody else and all the rest of it. Well, actually, that's now written into UK law. Um, we have a 2006 Companies Act, it's a thousand pages uh, or a thousand articles or, or um, provisions, but section 172, I think it's A or C, uh, says this, um, the duty of the directors is to maximize shareholder value while paying due regard to the interests of the other stakeholders. The difficulty is what does pay due regard mean and how do companies interpret that and satisfy the government they're doing that. And it's not terribly clear exactly what it means, so you have various corporate governance codes and so on, but basically companies are meant to report on that in their annual report and accounts. Um, but often it's a little bit of a, it's a bit superficial, it's like what people do with ESG, they kind of tick the box. So some companies are very serious about this, but a lot of it's kind of box ticking. Yeah, we had the suppliers for lunch and we asked them, do you want to work with us next year? They said, oh yeah, we certainly want to work with you next year. Well, of course they say they want to work with you next year. Who wants to lose a client? Uh, but it's kind of, you know, it's a bit superficial. Really engaging with stakeholders is a, is a 
a bigger uh, challenge. And, uh, and this is what we suggest as a way to move forward, which is perhaps the most radical element, I think, in the book, in a way, in terms of how to change corporate capitalism, let's say, in South Africa. And by the way, if you go onto the Relational Research website, you can download free of charge, just to make sure I'm not selling my books too easily to you. You can download free of charge the summary of this book, with the pictures and everything. <laughs> just download it. <laughs> but of course, you're going to get the rich content for the rest of the book. <laughs> so, this is what we suggest. Um, how to reform corporate capitalism, we suggest, is this, but it is quite a radical suggestion, and I will explain why. The purpose of a company should be to serve society, to serve society by maximizing, I'm sorry there's a couple of words missing here, I don't know if anybody can guess what they might be, by maximizing what? Long-term value creation. Long-term value creation in the interests of all the major stakeholders, including employees, shareholders, customers and suppliers, as well as fulfilling commitments to local communities and the global environment. Now, that's quite different from saying we're going to maximize shareholder values and pay due regard to the interests of employees and customers and suppliers without that being a very clear requirement. So, there are two ways to try and do this. One is to um, write something in your corporate governance code like King 4 here has done to say that companies must enter a dialogue with their stakeholders every year. And in fact, Mervyn King, who I greatly admire and who has taught me a lot, suggests there should be a chief stakeholder officer in the company, like a chief financial officer, chief information officer. You have a chief stakeholder officer who is simply responsible to report to the board at every board meeting what is going on in the stakeholder relationships which they deal with, and they have a staff who is like a chief financial officer, has a whole accounting staff, the chief stakeholder officer has, has a staff who are in constant contact with the stakeholders to see what's going on. And I think that's a really great proposal, um, but I think you can go a step further, and the case I would want to make is I'm just, just worried you have the highest GD coefficient in the world. I was assured at lunchtime today by some secular friends of mine who I had lunch with. But they were saying, you have to realize, they're not necessarily supporting what I'm saying, but they're simply saying, we have the highest GD coefficient in the world. That is the biggest, the most unequal wealth between, uh, within the society of any country in the world now here in South Africa. Now, I'm not sure that's correct because I don't think they're taking account of some countries in, in uh, Korea, for example. But it's still incredibly high. And that is going to be a major driver, according to Thomas Piketty, the famous French economist who's just written a major book on this, of social upheaval. He says, if you want to know if there's going to be major social upheaval and disorder in a country which is going to really take apart the system, look at inequality of income and wealth. Because if you don't address it, that's what's going to happen. Then the question is, you have to take a bet. <laughs> As a, as a society, you have to take a bet on this. Do you reckon you've got 30 years, 50 years to fix this? Or do you say, well, hmm, 2020 was it, or 2021, there were some riots around Joburg and places, and people were looting, and goodness knows what. But is there a sense of unfairness going on here where we need to be seen to do something faster than this? Something more dramatic? Well, I'm coming from the UK, I'm sitting in comfortable Cambridge, right? I have quite a vested interest. I've got, I've got a son living in Joburg, he's got two grandchildren there, who kind of, in a sense, are part of my family. And he's got, you know, he's fully engaged, he expects to be living in South Africa the rest of his life, God willing, and doing the kind of stuff he's doing. Um, but, um, but basically, I'm not in the front line like you people are. I don't have the same level of, um, of investment, if you like, in the society. 
although I feel it's quite a substantial investment, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here tonight. So I, I kind of feel that you need to take this jump, which is kind of creeping along slowly in some companies, but I think maybe the society needs to take a jump here. And companies need to become, if you like, servant companies. They need to say, all right, guys, we're get <coughs> companies can easily do this without actually it affecting their profitability. It'd probably increase their profitability. It'd probably be great for them to do this. They need to adopt a statement like this that says to society, we are now going to be a company that serves society and we are going to make ourselves accountable to these interests. So we're going to let the suppliers and the customers and the employees, as well as the shareholders, know what we are planning to do as a company. And if they don't like it, then they can complain because the law says, I'm suggesting the law says, that they are required to be accountable to these interest groups for their decisions. And if any of them are unhappy, they can appeal to an independent tribunal, probably, that will resolve that conflict of views and, and mediate between that stakeholder and the company directors, so the company directors are forced to reconsider that decision if they, if they are believed in what they say, that this is actually not in their interests. Now, you might say that's just too big a step to take. It's a risk for us to do that, and I'm just saying to you to think about, is the risk greater to do it or not to do it? Which is the greater risk? Because there's a risk, but you can also say, well, why don't, why don't companies simply, you know, companies act with limited liability and so on because that's a, a gift given by society to them. They give them the license to operate. So the government could do it a different way. They could say, well, if you follow this corporate purpose, we will give you 5% lower tax rate or 10% lower tax rate than the companies that don't do it. So we either raise it for companies that don't do it or we'll give you, a, or maybe a bit of both. You can say, we're raising our tax rate for companies 5% and we're going to reduce it for 5% from its present <coughs> level by this corporate purpose or something like it. Now, the different ways to handle it or the shareholders, you know, could get together and to say, we need just, we need to do this. So we're going to invest our funds into companies that do this, like BlackRock is saying, you have to do ESG. Otherwise, we're not going to put money in. Although I think they're now getting pretty skeptical, actually, about the box-ticking exercise and they're kind of starting to say, I'm not sure we can stay with this. Anyway, I think some companies are withdrawing from, uh, some, uh, some large investors are withdrawing from that. But you can persuade the investors to put pressures on, on their companies and perhaps, I don't know, isn't that something called uh, GEFC, Government Employees Pension Fund? I can't remember the initials correctly, but it's something like that. Is it GEFC? Have I got that right? GEF. GEPF. GEPF. Right. Government Employees Pension Fund. Thank you. GEPF. Right. The, the GEPF. -E -E you know, could take a public stand and say, well, we're going to focus our investment into companies that do this, for example. So there are different ways to bring about change, but the main thing is that there is some system of accountability of directors in their decisions to these different interest groups, not just to the shareholders. That's the key to this. And I'll just come back a little bit later to that uh, in a different, from a different direction. So, uh, I don't know if you can read that, if you can, yes, Relational Stability Strategy. In the book, I don't go on for too much longer, but in the book there are 10 points in this strategy. Um, and many companies, the book demonstrates these lists of names of companies that are doing this, practice one point or another, maybe two, maybe even three. Um, so, some companies are reducing pay differentials. Uh, some companies are increasing employee share ownership. Some companies are saying, we will pay our companies, we will pay our suppliers in 30 days as per contract. We won't somehow delay paying it for 90 days or 120 days even though we signed a contract for, for 30 days. Um, there are stories around that, but I won't get distracted. And 
We're also going to improve customer access. We will not make sure in the future that when you complain to your bank or anything else, all you get is an answer phone or, or you get into a long queue or send an email and then you get, um, you know, you get a, some AI chat box or something who's answering you and it's just thoroughly frustrating. You can't ever talk to anybody when you want to just you want to just fix a problem with the airline, you can do it in two minutes if you can just talk to somebody, but it's always, you spend an hour, like I did, coming over here with BA this time. So frustrating. And then they didn't fix it after that, even. Um, so, um, there are so many ways to satisfy these conditions. There's one company in Britain where, where the directors go on a sort of tour around the country every year, now. So it's quite a pain for the poor directors because they've got to travel all over the country because they have to meet all the stakeholders for that, this company in all the regions of Britain. And all the stakeholders in Murray are being meeting their customers and suppliers and employees and everybody's there and they can meet the, meet the directors and the directors give a statement about what the company's planning to do and they all kind of have their chance to comment and discuss and meet each other and all the rest of it. So, um, Companies are starting to think differently, but they just, in my view, there's just got to be a bit more of, a, of, of some sense of urgency about the shift. And then you can say, well, what can governments do? Well, I've talked about encouraging or incentivizing companies to change their corporate purpose. I, they can, of course, insist on, that, on reducing pay differentials between the top and the bottom of the company. They could say, all right, they could say, we're going to insist that 10 years from now, the maximum pay differential in a company is going to be 100 to 1. That means the lowest level person in the company will get the salary of the chief executive within 100 years of work. Now, you might think, that's still pretty outrageous, but to go from 1,000 to 1 to 100 to 1, is a huge shift, so you give them some years to make the adjustment. Actually, that was a really great suggestion by Mervyn King. I'll tell you this because I love the story. He said to me, you know, if you're in a big corporate, a lot depends on the salary paid to the chief executive because that actually drives all the other salaries right down through the company. So how do you get a chief executive to accept a lower level of pay? So he said, here's my suggestion. What you do is, you narrow it down, first of all, to the three candidates you want the most. Here are the three candidates you want the most. Now, actually, you don't know which of them is going to be best for the company. You actually don't know. Maybe the third best one might actually be the best one. You just don't know. So what you do is you invite them all to write on a piece of paper, put it in a brown envelope, hand it in, the minimum salary they would accept for doing this job. So they each put in their quote, if you like. I'll take this job if you pay me a million rand a year. I will take this job if you pay me five million rand a year, or whatever it may be. They put, all put them in the envelope, and then you choose the lowest bid. Who will do this job for the cheapest price? <laughs> now some of you here, I know, come from a Christian background, and you'll be aware of a guy called Tim Keller, who's quite a prominent Christian author. Now, I was talking to one of the elders in that church. It's in New York. It's Redeemer Church in New York. He's a very famous writer. If you haven't heard of Tim Keller, do look him up online. He's fantastic, I think. Anyway, he, this elder told me that actually Tim Keller was the third choice. They had three candidates for the leadership of the church. They tried number one, and he turned it down. Then number two, he turned it down. Then they chose, oh, let's have the third one, Tim Keller. <laughs> I think what they would have missed if they'd just taken the top one on that list. Actually, he was the third choice, but he was a fantastic choice. I mean, if you look at that church today and its influence globally, it's absolutely incredible. And also his writing is really inspirational, I think, in many, many areas. He's written books on forgiveness, he's written books on wisdom, he's just amazing, that writing. Anyway, I need to wind this up. So, um, so for Christians, what's the motivation for the agenda? I'll suggest, three major areas of motivation. Uh, I spoke this morning uh, to the students, and some of the students are here, and some of the staff are here, so I'm not going to repeat all this. Anyway, you've had enough for one evening from me. But um, 
Christianity is fundamentally a, a religion about relationships unlike any other world religion. Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, whatever. It's fundamentally about relationships. Think about the Trinity as a relational understanding of God. Think about covenant. Think about righteousness, which means right relationships. Think about the atonement, the cross. It's not a financial event or a military event. It's a relational event. Think about the church. It's a relational community. It's about a household. It's about it's described as a family. And think about eternity. Now, Christ describes heaven as being like a feast. And I'll meet some of you there, I suspect, um, at the dessert table. <laughs> um, but it's going to be a feast where we celebrate, and it's going to be, you know, what is a feast in Middle Eastern culture? It's a community event, isn't it? It's where we get together to celebrate being a community. Of course, we enjoy the food and the wine, whatever else there may be, but it's a community event. That's how Jesus is describing what heaven's going to be like. And we've tried to think about how you position this relational message in cultures like China and Korea and um, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan or wherever where there's not a lot of Christian influence, how do you position this? So we describe relationism as like a sort of social philosophy, if you like, as a way of understanding reality within this relational world. But of course, if you are a Christian, you understand it fundamentally coming out of biblical teaching and revelation, and the life and teaching of Jesus himself. So Christianity is all about right relationships, and I'm talking about what are right relationships, what do they look like in a company. That's what I've tried to set out this evening. That's what's underlying this book. The book never talks about Christ, it never talks about Christianity or the Bible or anything. It's an appeal, if you like, to good sense, um, good values, um, shared things that all of us share. If you're a uh, a black African, the word Ubuntu is in, is in 75 um, Bantu languages across Africa. I know that because a Bible translator told me he found it in, in 75 languages. This is a fundamental African concept. You know, it, it's not I am, but I am because we are. That's how I understand who I am. But it's also a deeply Christian understanding of reality at one level. Depends on how you apply it. So secondly, um, what's the motivation for the agenda? So do you know the story um, of, uh, that Jesus told about a man who went on a journey and he left the servants with some talents, that is a, a pot of gold, I mean a, a, a sum of money, quite a substantial sum of money. And when he comes back, he says, well, what did you do? So the first one says, well, I invested it, I made some return, great. And the second one says, he had five talents, second one had three talents, here's the man with one talent now. And the one man, man with one talent, some of you will know the story, he buries it in the ground. The master says to him when he comes back, why did you bury it in the ground? And he says, well the reason, sir, that I buried it in the ground is that I knew what kind of person you are. You are a hard man. Hard. That means I don't, I'm not concerned about the community, not concerned about anybody else. I'm a hard man. Right? In the New Testament, that is a nasty word because it's unrelational. I am, this man is a hard man. And he says, I know, says the servant, that you reap where you haven't sown. Well, who reaps where they haven't sown? Well, um, invading armies, people who come and steal your maize crop when you're asleep, <laughs> or your cocoa crop, or whatever it may be. People who steal. Um, these are the kinds of people who are um, reaping where they haven't sown. So the Bible generally endorses the idea that if you want to sow, if you want to get a reward, you have to put in the hard work. The man, the master says to him, okay, if that's the kind of man I am, then this is what you should have done with my money. Do you remember what he says? You should have given it to the bankers and I would have got it back with interest. So what he's saying, Jesus is saying, is he's explaining in the Old Testament this ban on interest. 
Why was it there? What's the reason for it? If you're going to apply it today, how do you do it? What's the driving force of this legislation? And I think it's here in what I've put on the bottom of this slide. No reward without responsibility. No investment without involvement. No profit without participation. Now, it's quite difficult for some of us to do this in practice. I have a self-invested pension scheme in the UK. That's something we can have, a SIP. It's called a self-investment pension plan. And of course, the government supervises it and this and that. I don't have all the freedom I want, but I have quite a substantial amount of freedom. But if you're a government employee in this country, all your money goes into this fund, and how on earth do you control what they do with it? And of course, you know, you put your money into a pension, and the pension fund then will give it to a fund manager who will give it to a broker who then puts it in a company and there's a kind of capital supply chain that's going on here, if you like, and you're pretty remote from it. How do you change that? Well, actually, you have to read my other book that came out at the same time as this one. It's called No Other Way to Peace in Korea, but you actually have to totally rethink your financial system to try and make sure the financial institutions are much closer to the communities regional banks, mutual societies, all kinds of ways that we can organize our financial affairs to decentralize it. But no reward without responsibility, no investment without involvement, and no profit without participation. You might think that is a dream, but at least we should say, well, if it is a dream, let's recognize it, let's state it, let's get it discussed, let's talk about it. Last point, last slide. Why should companies serve societies? serve society. Well, uh, again, some of you will know this famous statement by Jesus where he's talking about himself as the Son of Man. That's the way he kind of describes himself. He says, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve. The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And that's been a huge inspiration to Christian leadership, which is why we call people who work in churches ministers, because they're serving their congregation. I mean, that's the concept. But how come we call government ministers, government leaders of departments, why do we call them ministers? Where did that come from? Well, it came from Christian Britain in 19th century, Victorian Britain, where the church was such a powerful influence, it was like sort of filling up a cup and it overflowed into the saucer. The saucer being society. So the idea of servant leadership kind of was said by Christians at that time, well, this should be true of government officials as well. Unfortunately, they didn't take the next step and say, well, actually, that should be characteristic of companies. We should have servant leaders in government. We should have servant companies in society. So that's what I'm suggesting. Perhaps that maybe some Christians in leadership positions in corporates here in South Africa or in other countries should take the lead and make their companies into servant companies where the purpose of the company is to serve society by maximizing long-term value creation in the interests of all the major stakeholders with due regard to the local community and the global environment equals global community. So I should stop there. I'm sorry it's gone on a, on a bit, but um, some questions. I hope there's still some a bit of time for some questions. <laughs>